Well, I haven't studied ESG in depth, but I'm pretty skeptical of it. I think that it's basically a fig leaf that kind of allows companies just take a checklist and you know tick the boxes and keep doing that's, whatever they're doing uh, wrong. That's cold, but, Garth, and it, but I like I it. Mean, I mean, we live in a world that's dominated by checklists. Yeah. Right. I mean, this is the influence of lawyering, you know, not only in America but everywhere. I mean, if you just you know, you have enough paperwork to do something, you absolve yourself of responsibility, and, you know, nobody can tell who ultimately is responsible for things. So that, that I think, is typified, or I think ESG probably has a lot of elements of that, you know, in it. So right. I'm, I'm not talking about ESG. I, I mean, the, the greatest case to use is, I mean, what, what the, there are pharmaceutical companies that have cashed in on the on opiates, which, mm -hmm. okay, so I see that, I mean, we'd all probably like to short companies like that, but is it the means to an end? Is it, is it going to make you money because they're so corrupt, or are you doing it to, to try and do some, some good at the same time as, as making money? Well, so that's, that's a really interesting question, because when you looked at, say, Insys Pharmaceutical, which ultimately crashed, I mean, I was aware of Insys back in 2014. And that's when New York Times first reported uh, that there could be a problem with illegal prescription of its main drug, Subsys. Now, at the time, I thought, see, this is a regulatory short. And are we, and when you want to short something like that, you're depending on regulator who's been asleep for like 17 years to wake up and care about it. And, and that's a really hard short. And so when activist short sellers go out and say, I'm short this company, you should sell this company because I think the regulator is going to come for it. A lot of investors understand that that rings hollow. You know, like regulators, you know, only act a really small minority of the time. Mm. But what occurred to me when I looked at Insys was the whole time that, that it was public, the CEO or former CEO, he sold over $50 million worth of stock. And a lot of those sales were after that initial New York Times article. <laughs> and you had sell side analysts, even when bad news hit, coming out, reiterating buys, upping their target prices. And, here, and here's the thing. It's, and when I look at some of these really bad companies, American Addiction Centers is another example. Time and time again, investors were buying shares, management was selling it, and that's the financial incentive for doing these horrific things. So investing historically has been an amoral pursuit, right? Yep. So-and-so's money is as green as anybody else's. But the problem is that amorality of investing in today's world is leading to increasingly immoral outcomes. And so it's not Benjamin Graham's world, a couple of reasons. I think private sector has far more power over our lives than it did back then, number one. Number two, we, we live in a world where most senior managers have significant equity compensation incentives. And that wasn't always the case. So the bottom line is when there's a company that's well over the line, and investors are buying it or not selling it, they're providing that financial incentive. They are indirectly contributing to the immoral outcomes. So I think it's okay to go out and say, this is a dirtbag company, here's what they're doing, you should be out of it. Carson, when you start talking about insider selling in the wake of bad news, I mean, is that, uh, is that something you can say broad scale is always a bad, a bad issue? If a CEO has bad news, something that comes out, a bad media report, should they not be allowed to sell, basically? Well, it's, I mean, that, it, it, would be hard to, it would be hard to formulate the exact standard, but something definitely feels wrong when, bring, going back to American Addiction Centers, yeah. the co-founder, former president, COO, uh, Jared Menz, he sold a total of about $22 million worth of stock while it was public. After he was indicted for murder, along with two of the company's subsidiaries, by the state of California, and the indictment was later dismissed by the judge. But after he was indicted for murder, that's when he sold the vast majority of that $22 million after the stock dropped and he got out. So, yeah, I think there's, I think there's kind of a problem when somebody can do that. Now, he resigned from the company, so he was no longer day-to-day. No longer day, but, same, right? but, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean it, there should be some mechanism whereby your, your shares are locked. You're not allowed to do that. Is there a broader theme in some of the targets that you find? I mean, you have these companies that are in some way kind of feeding off of either sort of a government program or insurance or kind of operating in this regulatory gray area. Perhaps I'm, I'm thinking back to the for-profit education stocks, which ended up being great shorts because they were really just built 
to uh, the kind of launder student loan, uh, government student loan money. Mm -hmm. uh, is there, so is there a theme there that you're looking for companies where the economics are, are set up in such a way? Well, so to move, to basically move the line from investing being a completely amoral pursuit to it at least part of the time considering morality, I think we have to start with the most egregious harms. And I just, my feeling is that as much as I would like that type of harm, financial harms done to vulnerable segments of the population, as much as I would like that to be considered blithely immoral and a reason to sell, I don't think we're there yet. I think we have to start with things like denial or narrowing of access to health care, things that could result in bodily harm in addition to tobacco? bankruptcy. Tobacco companies? Yeah, somebody asked me about that, and I think, sure. it's, I think it's hard to convince, again, starting from this where we are right now, amoral position, I think it's hard to convince investors that when they walk around New York and see a number of people lighting up in the street, that this is a business that's immoral. Um, I mean, I don't, look, I'm not long a lot of stocks, so for me it's not a problem to say I wouldn't go long a tobacco stock. Right. I, think the, I think the most egregious, or the, the case there is what their conduct outside of the U.S. All right. So I mean, def defense contractors, they, they make weapons of mass destruction. Mm -hmm. What do we do? This other side to that argument is that we as a country also need those contractors. No, I, I mean, that's so... I'm just I've so, been playing devil's advocate. I certainly, you know, I, I, that's why the other, the, the ones that we talked about right at the top of the interview, those are the ones that kind of, that kind of get me because one man's Immor or woman's immorality is another, as I said, is another person's cause celeb. I mean, it, it, it's, and then when it's that subjective, then I, I think, you, you know, you need to think that through. Well, there are going to be, there are obviously, it ultimately becomes subjective. But when right. reasonable people are disagreeing, when we're having a debate, or when investors are having a debate about the morality of the company, and reasonable arguments on one side, reasonable arguments on the other side, I think we're in a great place relative to where we are now because this doesn't, doesn't factor happen. into our thinking.